Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Friday's science podcast titled Sex Differences in Sweden. Let's jump right in. Earlier this week, a group of researchers in Sweden published updated prevalence numbers from those that they reported a few years ago. What they found was not surprising, but it was interesting. First, they found the rate of autism in Sweden is increasing. This part is not surprising and is consistent with what's been seen globally. But beyond just the rise in prevalence, there were some interesting findings that I'll explain later. Instead of me going through all this, I thought it'd be helpful for the lead author, Selma Idring from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, to tell us what they found. Autism is one of the outcomes possible to study in the Stockholm Youth Cohort. Uh, first uh, and foremost, we wish to examine the most current prevalence of autism spectrum disorders, which was for year 2011. What we found is that 1.4% of all 0 through 17-year-olds in, in Stockholm had a recorded diagnosis of ASD by the end of 2011. And, uh, for example, the prevalence that we found among 8-year-olds in Stockholm is similar to the most recent estimates from the CDC in the U.S., and uh, so is the propor proportion of cases with intellectual disability. We also found that ASD prevalence increased with age, so it was lowest among children of preschool age, and then it increased to be highest among teenagers. And in fact, we found that almost 2.5% of teenagers in Stockholm had a recorded diagnosis of ASD. And this is, to our knowledge, the highest register-based prevalence of ASD to date. Moreover, we found that uh, the sex ratio in our study was overall lower than the commonly reported four male to one female ratio, and our results suggest that more girls are identified with ASD with uh, increasing age. And um, we also found a substantial increase of ASD prevalence among children aged 0 through 17, um, from 2001 to 2011, and uh, this increase was in fact mainly due to a sharp increase of ASD without intellectual disability. And on the other hand, the prevalence of ASD with intellectual disability just increased marginally during this 10-year period. And these findings are not unique to our studies, but also have also been seen in other countries, such as the U.S., she mentioned something in there that I wanted to explain a little bit. The sex ratio of males to females was 2.3 to 1. As you know, this is a lot different than numbers in the U.S. that are coming out to be around 4 to 1. Why the difference? Well, in this updated study, the Swedish group expanded the cohort by studying kids earlier and then following them later so they could measure when different groups of people were diagnosed. In Sweden, the sex ratio decreased with age. So it was about 3.3 to 1 among 0 to 12-year-olds, down to 1.9 to 1 in adults. In the U.S., the ratio of 4 to 1 was measured among 8-year-olds. So if you think about it, the numbers were consistent with what's found in the United States. So what were to happen if we studied adults in the U.S.? The ratio of males to females may go down. We don't really know because that study has never been done. One thing to note about Sweden, very few cases are identified early and the average age of diagnosis is eight. So it's probably a good place to look at teen and adult diagnosis, but it's not necessarily great to live in if you have a young child in need of a diagnosis with autism. So why would there be a change in the male to female ratio with age? Well, we know from the work of Amy Daniels and David Mandel, greater symptom severity and parental concern contribute to an earlier diagnosis of autism. So individuals with social and communicative impairments, but no real significant delays in language, cognitive and adaptive problems, may appear when the societal pressures start to become overwhelming. This can apply to a lot of females with autism. At the Sex and Gender Differences meeting we co-sponsored in October, Many of the women at the table felt like they had enough ability to get by early on without a diagnosis, but when things started to change in terms of different societal pressures and their expectation as, as girls, that's when the diagnosis started to really sink in. 
Clearly, there, this needs to be studied further. And while it's great that in the U.S. autism is detected earlier, we also really need to have an accurate prevalence of autism in adults. On to another study, this one making the rounds in the media, so you may have heard about it already. This was a study out of UC Davis that looked at the risk of autism and developmental delay in mothers who experience preeclampsia during pregnancy. Preeclampsia is a condition where a woman develops very high blood pressure in pregnancy, which is very dangerous. There's also sometimes protein in the urine, which suggests kidney failure. But actually, doctors have noted that there's a number of different organs that can shut down during this condition. It affects up to 10% of pregnancies in the U.S., probably more worldwide, and the condition can eventually lead to seizures in the mother. Preeclampsia also leads to a high mortality birth rate, and researchers have studied the link between preeclampsia and autism before with inconsistent results. This study showed a significantly increased risk for autism and developmental delay in mothers who had preeclampsia, especially those with preeclampsia and what's called plac placental insufficiency. This is actually the most severe form of preeclampsia. What was interesting is the conditions didn't just result in an increase in autism, but also developmental delays. So it may be specific for autism, but then also more broadly related to cognitive issues in general seen in autism. The author suggests that the one thing that may be going on during preeclampsia is a ramping up of the mother's immune system, and that, in fact, this immune challenge is what's responsible for the increased risk. This is pretty consistent with studies looking at things like infection and illness and risk of autism, but it's too early to conclude that this is what's going on with preeclampsia and this is why there's an increased risk of autism. The bottom line is, if you're pregnant, see a doctor. If you do have preeclampsia, it doesn't mean your baby will get an autism diagnosis, but it does mean that careful monitoring should be done for a number of outcomes. It's also pretty common for these infants to be born premature. I spoke with the lead author, Cheryl Walker, and she clarified that yes, babies born to moms with preeclampsia did show reduced birth weight. But they accounted for this in the statistical analysis, and there was still an effect of preeclampsia in both autism and developmentally dis disabled kids, even when the birth weight was accounted for. So something is going on other than just the simple explanation of low birth weight on, on autism risk, which has already been associated with autism. So as long as we're talking maternal inflammation, I wanted to tell you about a recent study from UCLA. It looked at prenatal immune activation and head size, this time with a twist. Not only did they just look at inflammation, they also looked at the interaction between inflammation and a specific genetic mutation. In case you were wondering how science can look at a specific exposure and a specific gene and a specific outcome, this study was done in mice. The gene studied was called P10. This is a gene involved in cancer that's also been associated with large head size. As you know, some people with autism are born with a larger head. So we do know that mutations of this gene result in a larger head size, but when pregnant animals were exposed to this immune challenge, the offspring had an even bigger head size than those just with the P10 mutation. This is what's called synergism, and it's an interaction between genes and the environment. I will also add that immune stimulation by itself led to autism-like behaviors, reinforcing the idea that there is something about maternal immune activation that leads to autism. But we really, again, can't be sure if this is what's causing the increased risk in preeclampsia. And one more new finding to round things out about immune activation and autism. Recently, the largest data set so far from gene expression in autism brain tissue identified a new type of mechanism. They revealed that a specific type of immune cell called microglia was consistently activated in individuals with autism. This microglial activation was also linked to expression of genes involved in autism. So this kind of highlights the importance of microglia in autism. Researchers kind of debate whether or not this is the root cause of autism, but it does illustrate how this particular part of the immune system may be able to turn on or off genes in the brain relevant for ASD. The reason nobody found this previously is because the number of samples to study has always been too low, and it's the perfect example of why more brains are needed to study autism. Please go to www.takesbrains.org to learn more about registering for the Autism Brain Net. In Autism Science Foundation news, I'm excited to tell you to save the date for April 22, 2015. 
the Autism Science Foundation is hosting its second annual Day of Learning and Evening of Celebration. The afternoon will feature the Autism Community's second ever TED Style Talks, and the evening will feature a fundraising gala, the proceeds from which fund pre- and postdoctoral autism fellowships. Find out more at AutismSciencefoundation.org. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. Throughout the week, we'll try and keep you updated on our website and our Facebook page with new autism findings. Talk to you next week.